in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my name is Joe Bruckner, and I'm meeting with Earl C. Sturm, S-T-U-R-M. Mr. Sturm has uh, kindly agreed to share his experiences about his upbringing and about his, his uh, activity and experiences in World War II with us for the uh, Veterans History Project. Uh, Mr. Sturm, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure and, uh, to be here. Could you give us, uh, again, your full name, your date of birth, and where you were born, please? Certainly. My name is Earl C. Stern. All my friends and acquaintances call me Claude right. for the C. I was born the seventh month of 22 of 24, 1924, okay. July 22, 1924. I was born in Oklahoma in the oil field areas. My father was in the oil, field, oil business. And about, about the second, around my second birthday, we were moved to the state of Texas where we lived on what happens to be the largest contiguous ranch in the United States, over a million acres at that time. It is since that land has been sold, it's only down to about 500,000 acres at this point. But we lived in a camp surrounded by iron pipe fence surrounding it because we had buffalo and cattle grazing on these uh, fields range there. And so we had the iron fence around the place. And we had 21 homes. And then these homes were the children that I was raised with. I was uh, lived there and the little area was called Rock Crossing. An interesting thing of history to the history buff is Rock Crossing, that area was one of the areas that wagon trains going west could get across the rivers and streams that hindered their travel on their western journeys. Why is it Rock Crossing? Because the banks of the creek was real steep, except for this one area which is an upcropping of rock, solid rock, and the water at that area was only about two feet deep. So this was where many of the wagon trains going west in the settlement of the United States crossed that area. And it was quite an area to, for history. Uh, at the camp, we were 20 some odd miles from the closest city. We had a barber shop and a little grocery store and a gasoline pump <laughs> for the cars at that time. But at any rate, at the camp, we had a grade school right across the street from where I lived along with the gymnasium. And the kids that lived out and around in a, you might say, a circle of about 10 to 12 miles, making a diameter of 20 miles, came to that school for elementary school, and then we went to an independent school district over by the Red River in Old Union, Texas. That takes me through that. At uh, uh, that time, the school systems in Texas only had 11 grades. And of course, I always told my friends in Oklahoma, they had to give them 12 because they were so dumb. <laughs> but as, as, as life proves, I proved to be wrong. <laughs> I wasn't ready for, for, for my life when I left college and left high school. Not many people are. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say to all of the young people that might have the opportunity to see this, but don't try to get out any sooner than you have to because you're not prepared for life. Good advice. <laughs> I'm the true example of that. <laughs> but then I um, went to high school there, participated in sports, as all of the kids do, and then uh, went on to college. I went to what was then Oklahoma A&M. It's now Oklahoma State. Uh, there... Stillwater. Stillwater, Oklahoma. And there I went into the freshman uh, ROTC class, and it really interested me. So I joined an organization called 
Pershing rifles after General John J. Pershing. And we concentrated on military agenda for our social and training life. And as a result, the two best real freshmen came from that class of Pershing riflemen. I took first, and the guy that ended up as our wedding as best man took second. Both of us was pla were placed in to the advanced ROTC because of our attitudes and so forth for wanting to be a commissioned officer of the United States Army. Hmm. Uh, I've covered this yeah. this part of it just a oversight. Yeah. Uh, but then, being young, so I went to school. Uh, when I was 17, college, and I found out, hey, these people that are in freshman in college are a lot more mature than I am. A lot more mature. And so the ones that I dealt with in the military organization is the one that I basically grew, stayed with all through my college and military career. We, uh, in order to go into the advanced course, the and this is a, I think, might be very interesting for the history here. Is uh, in order to for us to go into the advanced corps, if you were under age, you had to get your parents' permission because you had to join the enlisted reserve corps of the United States Army. Okay. So you were enlisted, you were a private, and then as you finished your ROTC training, if you got all four years in you were commissioned a second lieutenant out of college mm -hmm. with the training that you received yeah. on army bases and at college. Then, that was in uh, 1942, uh, I enlisted in October 42, and in March of 1943, the United States was well in the war. The Department of the Army, was the Army, U.S. Army, called all of the advanced our Army ROTC students that were juniors to active duty as privates. The ones that were seniors in the class were sent, were given their commission and sent on to a basic training course, basic officers training course at different army bases, mm -hmm. infantry, Fort Benning, artillery, Fort Sill, this type of thing. We went to Camp Roberts, California, where we went through basic individual training and advanced individual training. Then we had to go before an OCS board for approval to go to OCS, even though we were earmarked for OCS. At that time, of the 75 people that went on active duty with me, 74 passed the OCS board for approval to go to OCS. One was lost at that time. Then, our next assignment is led with, hey, they sent us right back to our own college where they had an AST, Army Special Training Program. Isn't that right? Army Special Training Program. And we went there while waiting on our OCS class for us at Fort Benning, Georgia, or wherever you were scheduled to go. We were there until, uh, I believe it was March of 44. March of 44. And uh, then we were sent to Fort Benning, Georgia for our officer candidate training. What was your what were your family's attitudes towards you going in and with it? Well, uh, in my family, uh, I think they were proud that I did because I was wanting to become a commissioned officer. I don't think they would have allowed me just to enlist into the army at seventeen. Yeah. But since I was in a program for commissioning, they thought it would be all right. All right. And of course, our family is a very Throughout the uh, American, I tell yeah. you, they're American yeah. all the way, yeah. and uh, so there was no problem there at all. And uh, 
when we got down to Fort Benning, we had people in our officer candidate class representing Georgia, Louisiana, LSU, Georgia, Ole Miss, Texas A&M, Oklahoma A&M, our, our school, Kansas, I forget the others, but keep in mind, all of the ROTC juniors in advanced military were all called on active duty. Now, every college in the United States that had advanced ROTC army. So it was quite a lot of the, keep in mind, the United States was getting ready for the invasion of Europe, and they knew they were going to have to have thousands of lieutenants. And that was the reason for this call. -up. Now, did you know that? I mean, you knew we were getting ready for it? And... Well, we, we recognized the fact, hey, we're going to go in there. Yeah. And uh, see, we had already been into Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knew that sooner or later, we were going to be there. So then I took the officer candidate course. It was a 17-week course. And uh, each four weeks, you had a board to go before before you determined whether you would continue on or whether you'd be high passed, kicked out, sent back another class or whatever. And of the group that I went in with, of the 74 that made, uh, went to OCS, 73 got through. And of that group from our college, we still maintain contact with each other. A lot, a lot of the people were now passed on but we had All-American football, we had All-American basketball, we had baseball, we had everybody to include me. <laughs> and I was, I was the youngest one of the crop <laughs> in our group. And, but I made it through OCS and uh, for a period of, a, I believe it was two weeks, I was the youngest second lieutenant infantry in the United States Army. Good God. Uh, so wow. I, I was 20 years of age. Jeez. When I joined my unit, the... Uh, and this was 1944? 1944. Wow. I was, after being commissioned, I joined the, I was assigned to the 63rd Infantry Division, 253rd Infantry Regiment, 3rd Battalion. And I was assigned to battalion headquarters. My job there was more or less uh, the uh, security for the... Uh, command people and uh, the flunky. <laughs> I did whatever the, the battalion commander wanted me to do. And it was it led to a very interesting uh, life while we were in combat, the things that I was able to, yeah. to do. So uh, Yeah, well you still were stateside, right? We now. were stateside. We're at Camp Van Dorn, Mississippi. That's about sixty or eighty miles, maybe a hundred miles, north of L S U. And on the weekends, we'd head for LSU. Uh, <laughs> Baton Rouge. <laughs> Baton Rouge. So, uh, but then uh, we went in and we were going to go through combat firing conditioning where you, you use live fire for all your exercises. And uh, the war in Europe was coming along pretty good. They had to have some more divisions. So three of the divisions, our training was cut short, and away we went. We, packed up all of the heavy equipment, shipped it, and then the largest convoy to go over left New York area along the coast. Three infantry divisions of combat troops. There were about 16,000 per division convoyed over to Europe, going through the Straits of Gibraltar and landing in Marseille, France. And that was, we were, when we landed in Marseille, we had uh, destroyer escorts, destroyers, shooting the mines as they break it loose in the harbor where all these ships, and every ship got to dock without being hit. We had two or three scares going over, but we, nothing happened. We didn't lose a ship or anything going over. But then we were Marseille for about two weeks while they rounded up enough trains and cattle cars 
to take these 48,000 people up to where they were supposed to to disembark and get ready for combat. But uh, as... It, now, approximately when was this when you got to Marseille? Uh, Marseille uh, must have been... Uh, October... Must have been the fir first week or two in November. Of 44. Of 44. And, uh, of course, when we got up uh, to Marseille, they had burned all of the trees, everything was burned, and this was cold weather for us. And the wind, we call it the windswept hills of Marseille, and you'd burn anything you could to stay warm. And then you always, because we had Ben Chuck Charlie, I guess you've heard that term, yeah. there'd be a German flag come over every night, sometime or another, and uh, Ben Chuck Charlie, and we had water stationed around these things. And I was duty officer one night, and right down below one of the other outfits uh, supposed to put the water on, put the fires out, threw a five gallon can of gasoline on it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we, we lit up the world. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> but at any thing, this is just one of the peculiar yeah. things that happened. <laughs> but then uh, we took 40 and 8s up. It took a three and a half days from Marseille up my division joined the, the Seventh Army. One of the other divisions went the first, one of the third. So three divisions. Now that was just for the infantry troops. The artillery that was waiting on their equipment to come in, and then they come up later to join us. And what was your responsibility now? What was your Well, I was assignment? a platoon leader. Okay. I was a platoon leader, and in a tactical situation, I had to secure the command post. And he, when you were in the attack, you were right there with, with the battalion commander or whoever it was, securing him. And then when you got on the position, you had to prepare it for him and yourself. Because uh, Lieutenant Colonel Battalion Commander has no business digging a hole. So, uh, but we did all of that type of work and then fought as a rifleman at times. It was, uh, as a platoon leader, we used them as riflemen, we used them as this, yeah. and the gophers. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you're now moving up through... Uh, well, through. what we're doing is just getting our feet on the ground. Okay. Nobody had heard of a shot and anger. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, as we were getting ready, or nearly ready, one night uh, an accident happened and somebody dropped a grenade and had a grenade go off, one man killed. That was our first casualty, this accident. But then we went up to uh, be the reserve of the 44th Infantry Division. And the 44th had been taking a terrible pounding. And uh, one of the most peculiar things in my career, when I walked into this one CP one night, command post, there was a lieutenant there that I said, I know you. He said, yes. I was your platoon leader when you were in basic training. <laughs> and he, he was still a second lieutenant. I just been promoted first. Jesus. Small <laughs> uh, well, he apparently had run afoul of somebody, uh, but he, he was a great officer. Uh, and he told us, uh, he really gave me a briefing on what was going on. He was able to take care of things. And, and where were you now? What, uh, the, we were in France, Alsace-Lorraine. Alsace Alsace okay. uh, the area. The area was uh, Klein's Blitterdorf because uh, the 44th got hit and had to be evacuated and we, we became the front line okay. uh, real quick like. And this was uh, somewhere around 1st of December, in December at any rate. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact date. Okay. But that's when the Battle of the Bulge started. And the Battle of the Bulge, of course, the, the big story took place with the 101st up at uh, 82nd, which was it, I forget now. Up at, 101st. Just uh, uh, up north. But one of our regiments was up there with those people in, uh, in the, what they called the Colmar Pocket. They got really beat to pieces. But we were surrounded 
my first introduction to combat is the German 17th SS Panzer Grenadier Division broke around us and we were surrounded for two days. And that was an interesting time, let me tell you. Tell us about that. Well, what can you say? We had all the artillery help we, we could possibly use. Of course, at this time, we battled the bulges really cranking. No aircraft. It was bad weather. And uh, when they, uh, I'll never forget when the, the day that uh, they got around us. It was about uh, 5,000 yards over to a little village over there. And we could see these troops coming out and going down the hill. And we started putting, we had 17 battalions of artillery on those people, but they just kept coming and coming and coming. They'd go out and pick them up and, to the vehicles and pick them up and take them back. But they got down into the back below and then they just kept coming. That night they bent feet right through us and surrounded us. And they couldn't get, they couldn't capture, but uh, we had a few captured that night, but uh, nothing that, that big of a thing. Did you have any casualties? We had, uh, oh, I would, let's see, in our battalion, we may have had 20 KIA and uh, maybe 15, 20, maybe 30 wounded. But uh, back in those days, uh, if you were wounded, if it wasn't serious enough to be put on a litter and tear down, you stayed. You, you just yeah. stayed there. And uh, it worked it out. Uh, but then uh, we broke the lines and uh, got it back together. When you were surrounded at the worst time, what emotions did you feel? Did you feel fear or, uh, or? anxiety? But you, you know, uh, one of the things I'll, I'll put this to you mm -hmm. as an answer. One of the things that I always taught the troops that I had under me is the army didn't win the war. Three people won the war. You, and the guy on your right, and the guy on your left. And if you three people take care of each other, you're going to make it. this. But keep in mind, the guy on his right has a man on his right, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're yeah. on his left. But this, yeah. and, but it's only three people that win the war. So as long as you had your people scared, I think his anxiety is instead of being scared. And you're going to do what had to be done to get it over with and stay alive, which we did. And then after we broke that off and they retreated, I saw my first uh, situation where our, some of our prisoners had been mutilated. And that was, that was because of the type of unit that we were confronted with. That was the... 17th SS Panzer Grenadiers and that SS troops. And uh, they had three of our people we found in a barnyard covered with barn manure and parts of their anatomy just cut off. So this this really gets you ready yeah. in a hurry. Yeah. And uh, then I saw evidence of uh, where the Germans had been run over by our tanks, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so, uh, but this this happened. That was war. Yeah. But then, as we said, uh, after our first taste there, we were sent back to an area where we got our baths. You know, mm -hmm. there's nothing like a hot shower, change of socks and underwear. And when you're up there, you don't get that very often. But it's, we were able to sit back, go back, get our thoughts back together, check our uh, standard operating procedures to see if there's anything we're going to change, and get everybody acclimated again and ready to go. Could we have a pause at this time? One of the things that that didn't cover while we were in Camp Van Dorn, Mississippi, uh, the Rangers Battalion that was in Italy, 
during the campaign in Italy had been absolutely decimated. They brought all of those rangers that were remaining back to the states and sent them out to these three or four divisions as teams to train certain officers and NCOs for uh, long-range patrolling that might be of assistance in uh, making it a little more hazard for the uh, German army to get their supplies and so forth. Well, send you on patrol to blow up bridges, you can cut railroad tracks, and this sort of thing. And uh, it, uh, I was one of them that was selected for that training. It, it helped me because uh, after we got through our first uh, episode of combat, getting surrounded, breaking out of it, seeing those things, we went back into, uh, you'd call it a reserve position, but it's a little, little, little bit more deep than that. But we were in a position where we could just train. And uh, the object of the exercise was for our battalion to go up to a town called Sargamines on the Saar River, Sargamines, France, Alsace-Lorraine there, would be there, and then we would be the first <coughs> unit of the 7th Army to cross the river into Germany with the river crossing. So we went up there, not getting into much of a fight because of the uh, uh, <laughs> because the river was there and they didn't come on and come across. But uh, it, it, it's very interesting as I'll find out later. But we went out and we trained for that. We patrolled across the river. We were trying to find out where the minefields were, uh, where their positions were, feeling them out, and. We found out the hard way that in the natural and best avenues of approach to a, an objective were thousands of shoe mines. So we had to de determine what we could do to get rid of the shoe mines. And uh, we came up with some rather unique ideas. We got dummy shells for rifle grenades and practiced with detonator cord tied to the fin of those things and then firing it to see how far we could get detonator cord and then explode the detonator cord to maybe make a path two or three feet wide. And we did this and we got through the, when we made the crossing, we had I don't know how many battalions. They they pulverized a forest. That they just obliterated it. And uh, that exploded a lot of the mines, but it moved mines. Yeah. So then what we did is after this is for the real thing, we didn't use dummy grenades, we used uh, regular rifle grenades and fire this detonator cord go out. When the round went off it exploded the the cord. Huh. And that gave us some paths to get through. We only had four or five people in that crossing to get wounded through the uh, 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 Schumann fields. And uh, we made that crossing, oh, it must have been February or March. I'm sorry to say I can't remember. But we went oh, up at 40, 45. 45. Uh, we made that crossing and we went into this objective that uh, later became known as Smoke Woods. Our battalion commander was Lieutenant Colonel John Smoke. And uh, because we were so successful in getting in as the first unit, uh, 7th Army, into Germany, they named that Woods for that. And, uh, we knew who we were confronted with at that time. The most unique thing, and I think it's interesting to show you how the German army was being disciplined. We were fighting against a stomach trouble battalion. Every man in the unit had stomach problems. 
and it was commanded by a major. And they weren't too good. They were older people and this sort of thing. They weren't good soldiers as such. This is the reason that we were so much more successful. And the night that we made the crossing, went up on this objective in the Smokes Woods, we had a complete circle around it. Our battalion commander, Colonel Smoke, decided he'd put the heavy machine guns, there's a little trail road right down through the battalion. He says, I want a platoon on the far side and a platoon on this side so that you can fire right down the middle of that road and get your other fire in there. So then we placed our troops, tried to get them away from the 25 to 40 yards away from the road. And that night, you can hear hobnails coming up the paved road. And Colonel Smoke said, they're coming up here to come in this woods, thinking we're down in a little village before they want to hit us tomorrow morning. Sure enough, they walked right up, column left, right down through the middle of the battalion, and he had everybody hold their fire until they were within about 40 yards of the outfit going out, yeah. where on the far side of the... And then those two machine gun platoons and everybody that had a weapon was firing toward the middle of the battalion. Gee, well. uh, we had uh, two medics that were in a hole together and a German straddled a hole they didn't have weapons. At that time, our medics did not carry weapons and uh, killed those two. But that night, we lost maybe 10 people and the next day, they set up graves registration to people to pick up over 200 and so on, 50, I think it's sort of 250, 260 dead Germans. Good gosh. So we, we got the, the unit was awarded the presidential unit citation for that operation. And tell uh, me what unit that was? That was the 3rd Battalion, 253rd Infantry Regiment, the 63rd Infantry Division. So. Uh, and we were all there, and uh, it was quite a thing. The next day, we had we were good and secure, and the battalion commander said, Claude, back you go. Get anything that you can get, and get this ammunition for the, up here. It's because that night, the amount of ammunition that was shot, shot out, was we didn't even put in artillery that night on our own position. It's all small arms. Small, small arms. Mm -hmm. And hand grenades. Mm -hmm. So it was, but it was a really, and you talk about a proud battalion. Yeah. Our first really major thing on a, initiated by ourselves. And uh, we were thrilled to death and with very few casualties yeah. considering what we had done to the enemy force that came in. Mm -hmm. Then it started the patrol actions. Nothing, just routine, <laughs> routine war. <laughs> routine, <yeah. laughs> routine war. Go here, go there. Uh, take that hill, take this town, do this, do that. Nothing really uh, that you would want to write home about and say, oh, this was, we nearly did good. But you were in combat virtually every day. Right? That's every day. Every day. We were in we were in a combat situation every day. Sometimes you wouldn't fire a shot. Sometimes it'd go a week before you'd fire one. And then you'd get into a real firefight. But then these were the things that then then we started going on and on and on. We pushing that further into Germany. And then we got to the point where oh I've got to tell you this story though. It's a funny one. Uh, when we were surrounded by the Germans back in December, shows you how my mind thinks. Uh, we had part of the Maginot line, there was big concrete bunkers. We'd been in, the, my group had been in this one bunker 
and it moved on over to another area where Colonel Smoke was. And I decided, I don't remember what I had him doing. I had some patrols going. I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go over and see if there's any of our supplies or something in that old bunker. And it wasn't 50, 100 yards away. You know. And I just blazingly started walking with it. And I get over close to that door, and the only thing I had with me was a pistol. Didn't have a run. And here comes a German out of that bunker. And he had a rifle in his hands. I pulled my pistol and I fired every round at him. He didn't even shoot at me. I missed him all of them. <laughs> I finally threw my pistol at him, turned around and ran. <laughs> and he did the same thing. <laughs> you were both happy. <laughs> so <laughs> the next day I got me another pistol, but I also got me a rifle. <laughs> but this shows you, these are the... It's stupid and one, <laughs> funny things that do happen. But at any rate, <laughs> that, that always gets people. You threw your pistol. <laughs> well, I did. Did you, hit, did you hit him? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm more than likely to hit Gip with it 20 yards. <laughs> we could, I imagine it was, we could have been 40 yards apart. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> I, I never could <laughs> fire a pistol. But at any rate, the... Uh, as I'm getting back to the thing where we're, we're driving up to uh, Germany, and we got to where we were on the outskirts of uh, the Siegfried Line. And uh, they started, uh, our battalion was pulled back and uh, found out that the attack on the Siegfried Line was going to be a column of battalions by division. So, if the width of this paper represented an infantry battalion area, that could be 600, 800 yards across. The infantry battalion was trying to go through that area. And then on the right and left of that battalion would be a battalion from another division. Okay. And we had a column of battalions. And Colonel Smoke said, Clark, guess what? You get to go up with that first battalion and see what it takes to bust these bunkers. Because in my ranger type tank training, I became proficient, somewhat proficient, in uh, uh, the demolitions. So we did, and then we knew that we weren't going to be committed until the division commander thought he could break through the signal line. So I went up with this first battalion to hit, and uh, I have no idea how many were killed and how many were wounded, but I do know that at that first battalion, after two sergeants and I came back, after witnessing what, what had to be done, there were only 70 some odd people walked back. Out of how many? Well, that's an infantry battalion, which is uh, 160, uh, 160, uh, about between five and 600. Jeez. And we were up to strength. My battalion had been given some brand new equipment that we had tested. Instead of having Jeeps, we had a Jeep track vehicle. And that was so that uh, the PSI that that vehicle put on the ground would cause a shoe mine to go off, but it wouldn't cause a tank mine to go off. And we could go through with litters or, you know, okay. evacuate the wounded and so forth. Yeah. But then we had column and battalions, and we, the first day, the next night, the next day, going on through, and that next night, he told us we're going. And we took off around midnight, walked straight through the signal for the line without firing a shot. My but what happened, the preparation for this, I didn't tell you. We had, there must have been, 
It was a different type of bombers that the Air Force had at that time. You had uh, the heavy bombers, the 19s and the 24s that carried heavy loads. Then you had attack bombers, which were A-20s, little twin-engine bombers, and B-25s. And we must have had over that <coughs> all two or three division front, uh, over 2,000 some odd yards, about 2,000 yards, we had at least, I want to say 10,000, I'm not sure it was that big, but thousands of bombers to come in and bomb them. And then we used dozers then to come in and they got up to the dragon teeth and they weren't shooting at people, they were shooting at the dragon teeth to cause that much more shrapnel. That's where most of the... Oh. But then the dozers came up and bulldozing dirt up over the dragon teeth so that our tanks could go over the top. That is what they did. And then when we were committed, all we had to do was... To, one of the unique things, though, that we had happen, uh, <laughs> they got to this one disappearing gun. Huge thing. You could shoot that at that thing all day, and it, it'd still go up and down and fire it. And uh, they said, "Well, what are we going to do?" Well, they had a half track there. They loaded that half track up with explosives, and when that gun went down one time, they had a tank dozer shove that thing right on top of the disappearing gun, and then when it went down, set it off. And that stopped it. <laughs> but but that's, fortunately, I was there and saw it all happen, and I wasn't doing it myself, but I helped with the, the operator. Yeah. I thought, that's going to be a big bang, boys. Yeah. And it was. <laughs> and it was. Guess, yeah. <laughs> but it stopped that thing. Because the secret for the line at that point was six and story, seven stories deep. They had laundries, they had mess halls, they had everything. And that, and just not enough people to demand. Did you have an opportunity to look around the Siegfried line once you went through and see up? Oh, uh, not really. I was in just that area where we were because we we went clear to the Rhine River that night. Okay. And so uh, we went straight on through. But I've got to go back and look at this one. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, what we were doing at that time, I say we, it wasn't me, the people that were uh, they still had people down in those places where after we got through. And what they were doing, they wouldn't come out. They were taking 55 gallon drums of gasoline and rolling them down the steps and lighting it. You know? Yeah. And uh, that convinced a lot of yes. us. Yes, I would think so. So at any rate, then, and the, uh, I believe it was the 17th Airborne uh, jumped across the Rhine River the next morning. We had a bridgehead across the Rhine. Then. And from then on, the war was not a real heavy thing. Mm -hmm. You did get into firefights. Some of them were bad. And, but you weren't you losing the half a company or, mm -hmm. or you're losing a platoon or a whole squad at a time. And that's uh, one of the things that I think was, uh, was on our side, and yeah. thank goodness, now, I wasn't confronted with that. And uh, I know uh, a lot of people. Uh, I don't know what, how I'm doing on time. Oh, here, we're good, good shape on time. Okay, don't worry about that. Okay, a lot of people will wonder about uh, how the Purple Hearts came. Our battalion, the battalion surgeon was one that made decisions as to who got the Purple Heart and not. If you were hit, you got it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that happened in many of our crossing of the things, I had a, I had my ha helmet on, I had a uh, round, I saw it explode, I, it must have been two or three hundred yards away. Big, heavy round explosion. I just forgot about it.
this large artillery round went off 200 yards away from me. And I just turned and started walking off. Didn't think. All of a sudden, something knocked me to the ground, knocked my helmet off. I took my helmet off, and a piece of shrapnel from that round had taken the top third of my helmet right off my head. It just cleaned it off. And, uh, of course, a new helmet was required. <laughs> but it didn't hurt my helmet liner. Now, I've, I've been thankful that I had a good helmet liner that day. But it's, these things happen. Uh, when we went into smoke ruins, I didn't tell you about this, I got blown off a vehicle. And I was a little more crazy than normal. Every time one of these mortar rounds would come in, I'd turn and walk toward it. And the, the soil up there at that, where we were, was real moist and sandy. And all of this explosions, finally a medic came out and tackled me and drug me in a ditch. My face looked like hamburger meat, but just all it was was sand, little pieces of sand. I wasn't hurt, but I looked like a piece of hamburger. And I had some stuff in my neck, and uh, I went, went down to the aid station, and the doctor said, man, am I going to enjoy this? <laughs> but he cleaned me up, and uh, after he got me all cleaned up, he said, here, gave me some calamine lotion. He said, don't get out around too many these white and black boys. <laughs> of course, we didn't have any at that time. <laughs> because you, you look like Al Jolson with his makeup. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, I was back on the line, but then all that stuff just dried up. I did have one piece here that was with me until after the war was over. Just a little, just a little thing. No, no purple heart for that. Uh, I wasn't hurt. I was hurt. Yeah, my, my vanity was hurt. I wasn't hurt. That infantryman that we had at that time, because the one, two, three, you and me, uh, three guys were in the war. Mm -hmm. These, hey, they didn't want to leave the buddy. Yeah. And they didn't. They didn't. You had to be down and out, boy, yeah. before. The, you can't imagine just how great these soldiers were. But uh, in comparison today, with a soldier today, this soldier today is worth three of us, two or three of us at that time, because of technology. Yeah, yeah. But it gives you, I, I'm going to varying off here, That's okay. but I, I'm varying off with, to the abilities of our young soldiers that we have in the United States Army today, yeah. compared to what we were. We were all good for that time frame. Couldn't have been better. But then I uh, took uh, uh, all these different episodes. The 6th Armored Division passed through us once, uh, and they took off down through there and uh, headed for as far south as they could go and as fast as they could go and keep the supply lines open to them. So they needed some assistance to assist keeping the roadblocks open. If they had got a roadblock and there's people shooting out, they'd go around it. Then they'd like for somebody to come in behind them and clear it off. If it was actually abatees and this sort of thing, uh, they'd have to clean it up. But what they did, Colonel Smoke assigned me as a little task force. I had a, t a light tank. All of my men were loaded on half tracks. I had radio jeep and all this stuff. And we'd take off just down to, I knew which, what main road they were. I'd go down the road until I found a roadblock. And if there was, looked like it had uh, the, and I had a dozer too. And uh, if it uh, looked like it's bite, they may have minded it. We'd throw off, throw, uh, what are Forks, what do you call them? When you throw a fork in to a hook, a hook, hook, yeah. hook fork. Yeah. What is? I can't think of what that we call. 
but we'd throw that in with rope, drive up through the black tank up close, button it up, tie it on, then get out of the way, and then that tank would start backing off, trying to explode any mines that were in there. And we did that. And then we had a dozer, we had uh, engineer tools, power salts, take the dozers, shove all that stuff off, so that the trucks could get on through to get down to the armor to keep them loaded with gas and ammunition. Are you moving towards Berlin during this? No, no, this we, were, the, we were going south. You were going south. And we were going south. The third army and the first army were okay. Berlin now. So we were going south down to southern Germany and Austria. So, but I had that and it was, it was a very exciting time, you know, to be out there by yourself, 20 miles from any troops. But with it, hey, all you'd see is people giving up. Mm. The war was coming to a close at that time. And uh, the, the armored division didn't want any troops. They didn't want to take any prisoners. They just told them, keep marching, keep marching back. And you come up, they'd come up to you. <laughs> and, uh, and you just tell them to keep, keep, keep going moving. towards the rear lines. Huh? <laughs> well, they'd, well every, every once in a while they'd send up some people to me yeah. and uh, get some people and take them back to yeah. trucks. It was quite interesting, yeah. and, but it wasn't, wasn't exciting except for the fact it's something I'd never done before, and very few people more than likely had that opportunity. And you were winning the war. And we were winning the war. And then uh, it got to the point where all of these new divisions that went over about the time we did, mm -hmm. they wanted to let the divisions that had fought through Africa and all across Germany to finish the war. They wanted them to. They started it, they finished. And so, uh, I forget who it was. I believe it was the 45th Infantry Division. Uh, that was the Oklahoma National Guard Division. Uh, went through us and they were progressing. But they'd, they'd go into a town move into the hotels at night and get up at 6 o'clock the next morning and take off. But the, the war was basically over, but you'd still get the strikers. And at that time, uh, we were just following. And uh, I was on a reconnaissance one day for Colonel Small. And on an area that I, I, I'd run out of maps. Didn't have any maps. And uh, it happened into this area concentration camp. The first time I'd seen one. Oh, tell us about that. Well, yes, uh, I had uh, I, myself, my driver, I, I had a couple people with me apparently. I don't recall. But uh, we got there and I walked down and we already had American troops on hand. There. And uh, when I walked into the area where the ovens were, the ovens were still warm, and you could see the bones laying inside and so forth. And outside of the of oven area was two wagons loaded with bodies that they were had been bringing them in to put them into the ovens for the cremation. And uh, we were there, and you just didn't want to be handling the bodies. They were setting up graves registration people to come and supervise that. And we didn't have people to do it. It was a town, a little village. When we were there, that town it was two or three clicks away. And uh, I said, well, why don't they go over and get the people from there to come over and take care of this? And uh, they had civilian people were coming in to supervise. Yeah. And they did that. And the German people of that town swore that they didn't know what was going on. Baloney. What was the name of this camp? Do you remember? I can't recall. We, I, my wife, I had got her there one time. You remember the name of the yeah. I don't recall it. What, what, was the, uh, what were the emotions of the German people while they were doing this when you were Well, watching? I left about the time the first yeah. um, because I had other things to do. And yeah. they, there were people there. And yeah, what were your emotions when you first saw this? You just couldn't imagine. I went to some of the rallies. I saw 
a lot of saw the area where they had the shoes and the hair and all of this stuff. But just before I left, we heard a moan coming from a wagon. And I've never seen American troops get as busy as they were. They said it might be somebody alive. What it was, though, was, you know, when dead people are dead, the gases that yeah. are built up, yeah. it was the gases exploding, ex coming out of their bodies. And that sounded like a groan. Oh, this, uh, people can't imagine seeing bodies stacked up. I can't. And, and, and uh, guess what? That was the day the Germans signed the armistice. Really? What was your feeling when you heard that, that the war was over? Well, hey, uh, the first place I stopped, I had a quartermaster unit, and they were all drinking Coca-Cola. I hadn't seen a Coke in a year. <laughs> and my driver and the people with me, we all got a Coke. Our first Coke in a year. And so then, naturally, uh, with that thing over, we never done any more shooting down. Yeah. I, yeah, I tailed it back to, the, to our yeah. regiment, our battalion. How much longer were you in Germany before you came back over? To the over camp? a year. Over a year. Yeah, I was there. Well, I think that what I have, I can tell you about, but the as we got plenty of time, I, because it, because well, we, we, it, we got a, a few I, minutes. But if we run out of tape, we'll just get another tape. Okay. Well, then uh, we had the problem, the problem, faces of displaced people, and. Uh, our battalion was sent to a village up in the area where the Germans had used this containment area uh, working with uh, uh, gases. It was a very secret type organization place up there. It's called Wildflecken. And we were sent up there and uh, they had brought in the camp, the whole thing, all of the buildings were filled with Polish displaced people. Now there were maybe a couple thousand in this area. And so our area duty was to secure that area and allow these people, feed them, this sort of thing, until they could get transportation to put these Polish DPs on trains and take them to Poland. They didn't want to go to Poland. See, that was yeah. Russian. Yeah. But we, the agreement had been, go back to your country of origin. So we started putting them on trains and just a few troops, you know. And those people at every stop, they'd get off and run. Really? Yes. Huh. Finally, huh. finally, we had to build swing mounts out from the doors of the train mm -hmm. with machine guns mounted on them. And every time the train would stop, they'd fire a few bursts up and down the track to keep people from jumping off. Yeah, right. Now, isn't that, isn't that terrible? That is terrible. Yeah, it's, it's terrible that we had to do that, yeah. but it was a part of the agreement. Yeah, no choice, I guess. Now, and then those that were staying, it was so still so cold, they started taking the roofs off the buildings and burning them to keep warm. Huh. And so uh, I would say a good 20% of the buildings in Wildflecken were burned by the Polish DPs to stay warm while we were there. Right. Not much you can do. You don't want to kill them. No. You can't do that. No. What do you do? No, you can't. You can't. We were, we were the good guys then. Yeah. Did you deal with the Germans at all, the German civilians? Well, oh, yes, there? I'll tell you about that because it becomes quite interesting. Because as soon as that was over, they decided that, okay, they're going to start sending people home. They came up with a criteria, a point system, where people with so many points would not be sent back to the states initially. Those sent back with the least number of points, would be sent back to the States and become replacement troops for the war in the Pacific. They'd been there maybe a month or 
month and a half, two months, and they ride back to the States and you know, leave and then head for the Pacific. Now this, this was one of the, I had sufficient, all of our, the people went over, we were saved by that. But then, here I was, uh, just 21, and uh, hey, I liked what I was doing. That time, because there's nothing going on, really. Uh, I helped pack up our battalion and turn all their equipment in. And then the people were sent out to the units that were remaining in Europe. Some of us went to headquarters, some of us went, went to other divisions, and so forth. So the first reassignment that I had was to the 36th Infantry Division, 142nd Infantry Regiment, located in Kirchheim, Germany. And I went there and, okay, that's a 36th Division, was a Texas National Guard Division. Some of the people I may have known or done, I don't know, since I was from Texas, but anyway, uh, went there and then they got their orders to rotate to the States. But we packed their equipment up and sent it all back with them to go back to Texas as a Texas National Guard. And then the people that went back with them that weren't from Texas then were released from the service then and went to their own homes. Well, so when we packed them up, I uh, got reassigned. I said, well, I'll stay on over here. And uh, I got reassigned to the 3rd Infantry Division. The big red, the, big red one. The, the, the blue, oh, yeah, the, yeah. the third division. And when I got there for about two weeks, when I got assigned to division headquarters, I was put in the MP detachment. And they were organizing the MP platoons into MP companies for uh, 